Welcome to Rising Stars, where Miriam Knight, publisher of New Consciousness Review, interviews exciting new voices in the world of progressive and transformational books, films, and ideas who offer intriguing perspectives on life, the universe, and everything in between. Join us as we celebrate the conscious awakening and explore many expressions of consciousness in action. Delighted you could join us. And our guest today, our first guest today is Frank Huguenard. Frank holds a degree in science from Purdue University, worked in Silicon Valley for 20 years, and has always possessed a keen fascination about the nature of truth and reality. He has spent a lifetime pursuing knowledge from every source available, and this search and ignited in him a passion to sir, share this knowledge with the world. This resulted in a series of documentary films on science, consciousness, and our future, including Beyond Me, Beyond Belief, and Beyond Reason, and now The Physics of the Soul. Gary Zukov said of his new film, The Physics of the Soul, is the most cogent and intelligently presented vista I have encountered of the evolution of science that is underway. It points directly toward the species-wide transformation of human consciousness that is in motion. Welcome, Frank. Hey, Miriam. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm very well. Thank you, Frank. You know, it's interesting. We talk about this um, transformation of human consciousness, and you really made a transformation of your consciousness from science to spirituality. I'm kind of wondering what prompted that shift for you. Well, to me, and in fact, this is what I really wanted to highlight in this film, um, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, to me, there's no difference between the two. Um, you know, science in its truest form, philosophy in its truest form. Philosophy, as you well know, uh, it taken from the Latin, philos in, in uh, Sophia means the, the love of knowledge or the love of wisdom. In scientia is Latin for um, to know or knowing. And they all merge together when you consider that the idea behind all of them is to get to the truth of reality, the ultimate truth. Um, and the way that science has evolved over the last few hundred years has gotten away from, um, you, you know, they've sort of painted themselves into a corner. And the more they've gone forward with both science and philosophy, the more brittle the structures become to the point where uh, science itself can be falsified and proven to be basically incorrect. That's very true. Now, you you show the kind of splitting off at the time of Newton and Descartes from a more holistic view of nature and physical reality and science to a more cerebral evidence-based view. Now, I'm kind of wondering, do you think that the advances that we've made in technology would have been possible without that kind of tunnel vision? Um, actually, I do, I do think that would have been possible. And, and I've looked at, to me, one of the most fascinating aspects of, of of looking at Descartes and Newton is that, and you look at Lamarck and, and uh, Berzelius and Mendel and Weissman and, you know, all the way through the, the modern synthesis, it took hundreds of years for this process to really take place. Cause so you can't really point to any one individual date, you know, August 14th, you know, 1642 is when this split happened. It took hundreds of years and it's, it's a fascinating, uh, you know, adventure into human sociology to look at how, um, you know, it's human nature to somewhat have a herd mentality. And it, it was a very gradual process. And there's no reason that we couldn't have had the same level of um, technological growth while at the same time embracing more of a holistic um, worldview. Um, it was more or less a, you know, for every, according to Newton, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, and the reaction that became modern science was a reaction to, you know, the, the, the um, Vatican's heavy handedness in Europe and the, you know, mm -hmm. in the mid, mid uh, millennia, last millennia. 
And yet it was a very fruitful reaction. So we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. We, we obviously um, have made uh, exponentially rapid strides in uh, understanding the nature of reality. But it's like we have sort of asymptoted and we can only get beyond that by coming full circle back to the idea of the role of consciousness in all of this. Yeah, I really love what uh, Garrett Modell saw, says in the film. Um, and for those who haven't seen the trailers or the previews, the film's loaded with the who's who of sort of people and in the consciousness studies. And Garrett Modell is a particle physicist uh, in, in Boulder at uh, University of Colorado. And he was comparing it to jazz music and the way he was taught how to, you know, learn jazz. And the first, it, it goes in three stages. And the first stage is where you play and you play and you play and you learn and you play. And the second stage is where you learn the theory and you, you learn the chords and the, you know, all the, the sort of tedious stuff and the, you know, the rigorous um, structure to jazz. And then the third, third stage is you throw away everything in the second stage and you go back to playing and you do so at a much deeper level. Um, <laughs> yes. And it's really brilliant the way he says that. And that's basically what he's saying is happening now in science. The old view, the, the world, the ancient worldview was consciousness based. Uh, you know, over the last few hundred years, okay, now we threw that away and we got busy with, you know, the rigorous and, the, you know, the designed experiments. Uh, but now we're coming full circle to a point where we're realizing that reality is consciousness based, but we're doing it at a much deeper level now. Uh, tell our listeners where they can find out about your films. Sure. Uh, they're all on my website. My first film I did five years ago was called Beyond Me. Um, which really to me is is all you need to watch it's it really explains a lot about why we meditate and and uh, has everything from evolutionary biology into uh, modern psychology um and so the website is beyondmefilms.com with a s on films either way works okay good beyondmefilms.com um well the the overview that you give of science and spirituality is really beautifully done. I mean, considering that we're talking about um, <clears throat> all of human history, <laughs> and all of philosophy and all of science. Um, how did you actually come to conceive of the structure? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm a, bit, a bit of a hack um, in the, in the most, uh, you know, uh, best word, best use of the word. I don't, uh, you know, I, when I used to write software, I did the same thing as I do now. Um, I, and I compare it to throwing pottery, um, which drove some of the people in Silicon Valley nuts because, you know, I would go. And, and for those who don't know my story, I, you know, 15 years ago, I invented a product four years before anyone had ever heard of Skype or YouTube that did both. And, of course, I got fired for it. But, <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't be here right now had not all that happened. But um you know, the way I work is very organic like that, you know, like throwing pottery. And so a year ago, I mean, I did the first three films and they're, they're, I thought I was sort of done with that. Um, and a year ago, I, I kind of had this thought, okay, I'm going to do a film on healing. Um, and, you know, when I started, I had the most amazing ramp up. I mean, six people, including Zukov, who I had approached earlier for other films, who had either said no or didn't even bother responding had all said yes within the first 10 days. You know, I mean, this was ridiculous. And, and quickly I started to realize that this was um, more than one film. It's at least five and it, it could be as many as 10 films because you can put, I, I like to use, uh, you know, something I've come up along the way is that the word health is a verb. Um, you know, you can't really talk about health as a static moment in time because all organisms are constantly decaying and rebirthing and it's an it's a constant process um you know the human organism is you know it, it's a self-healing machine that's what that's what we do we heal automatically or all organisms do that you know so how do we achieve optimal performance you know in maximizing the resilience of this organism and you can put 
you know, healing happens on five levels, physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual. So you, you can put almost anything, you know, in the world underneath that umbrella. So um, the first film that uh, is, is called The Physics of the Soul is an introduction, and it really just says, look, there's too much here that science in its current form can't possibly embrace uh, so either one of two things, we're going to have to change science or we're going to have to discredit thousands and thousands and thousands of scientific studies that prove this, this is a legitimate phenomenon. Well, you know, people, uh, come up with their scientific theories based on their knowledge at the time. And so mm -hmm. it's legitimate for, uh, science to change. And I think people don't have to feel so defensive about it when new information comes to light. And certainly the, the sort of revolution in the role, the, the appreciation of the role of consciousness in science and specifically in healing um, is really a game changer. I have at least five books on my desk. Of course, it's a very cluttered desk um, that not only talk about the physical aspects of healing, but also the mental, emotional, spiritual uh, aspects as well. You cannot look at it at any one component in isolation anymore. That model is becoming outdated. And I think that's what you show so beautifully in your film. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your, your kind words. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting process. Because uh, I'm half teacher, half artist, half researcher, half. And by the way, uh, you know, <laughs> lots of halves in there, Frank. I, I <laughs> yeah, I'm a little schizophrenic. I guess that's my <laughs> my Gemini. But um, I did this whole project um, myself. Uh -huh. I did all I did all the filming, the interviewing, the post production, pre production. You know, da 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 da. Um, and I just find that it's a it's a tremendous medium to be using the in this wow. day and age. Wow. Yeah. Well, we are speaking with filmmaker Frank Huguenard about his latest film, The Physics of the Soul. Please stay with us. We're going to go to break and then we'll be right back. The Real Conscious Connection. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Have you ever wondered how to change your love paradigm? The secret key is finding a love partnership, not just a regular connection. How do you find these? Through conscious relationships. Ascending Hearts Dating is a dating site for people like you that believes in second chances and a different type of spiritual connection. Try Ascending Hearts for free today at AscendingHearts.com and change your love paradigm. Ascending Hearts, the premier dating community for the spiritually awake. to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Alaya, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. Conscious Media for Conscious Minds. Ohm Times. This is such a beautifully constructed film. Um, how did you actually uh, put it together? Did you have sponsors? 
Uh, no, actually, if, if you if someday when I write the book, it'll be quite amazing. But, um, you know, other than cost of living cost, which are, you know, I would have had to pay any anyway, the, the total amount that this film cost just for uh, travel expenses, um, you know, the um, the audio tracks, the soundtrack um, was less than five thousand dollars, which is ridiculous i mean i i don't i don't think that's i think that's completely unprecedented and of course 15 years ago the quality and and, and scope and caliber of a film like this probably would have cost you know millions um so technology is amazing um but i've been you know i had a small uh crowdfunding um activity for this that, that i raised a little bit of money and uh you know, it's it's just a very, like I said, organic practice. I in the last year, I've driven almost thirty thousand miles, stayed at a lot of Motel Sixes, and ate a lot of Subway sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a higher sacrifice, I can't think of. Yeah, and uh, you know, I interviewed uh, almost forty-five people total, and um, and eleven of them made it. Ended up making it into the you know first part. Although a lot of the material I have is still very much appropriate for the follow-up uh, installments in the series. Um, and, and as far as constructing it, there is no way I could have scripted this. That would have been impossible. You, you go and it's a, it's a beautiful, I love being out on the road. It's pure magic. Um, I'm out in the middle of Tucson, Arizona, and I've got just enough money to make it back to North Carolina. You know, I've got everything kind of, you know, budgeted out to the last penny and my brakes go out Oh gosh! <laughs> and it's $500. And an hour later I get a $500 donation. Oh my goodness. Oh, and that's, that, that's just how it is out on the road and the process of rolling. Um, you know, I don't think Gary Zukov or Stuart Hameroff or whoever else is in the film expects me, you know, uh, someone who's well versed in both science and spirituality and philosophy to walk in the door and do interviews. You know, they they do these uh, documentary films all the time. But mm-hmm. I can meet these people where they're at, whether they're an author or a, you know, whoever they are. And um, just the entire process of taking what I learned from one interview, researching on the road to the next interview, and just you know, snowballing all the information. Um, and then you get back and you start molding it into a film, and it's. Uh, you, you you go have a focus group and you show it to people because you think it's brilliant and they hate it. <laughs> so they, but yeah, you take their feedback because focus groups are a critical part of the process. So you take their feedback, you mold it all together and you go show it and you think, okay, now it's it. And, but after four or five or six focus groups and, you know, putting your own heart and soul into it and, and getting feedback, you end up with something that's, uh, you know, way different from what I would have imagined doing, you know, from the start. What is your hope for the impact this film will have? Oh my God. (laughs) I mean, I can be very grandiose about it. Um, Other than changing the world. Other than changing the world. Exactly. (laughs) I mean, uh, you know, there's a beautiful song at the end of the, of the film that really leaves a punctuation mark, but we have to, you know, certainly in my own life, uh, 15 years ago, my, my life blew up and it was not that I was a choir boy prior to that. You know, my life needed a personal course correction and, you know, the universe, you know, beat the crap out of me until I got it. And right now humanity needs a pretty significant course correction. Um, science has, um, you know, they, they've taken, they've made some some tremendous blunders. Some of the things that they've assumed to be true have proven not to be true. And we need to correct that. Um, and, and, you know, like I say in the film, science is based on something called materialism, which is that, you know, scientific reductionism, that, that everything's material and there's nothing beyond that. And there's no coincidence that uh, science is inherently materialistic. And so is all of Western civilization. You know, and so that that needs to change. We need to imbibe and embrace. Uh, I like what Deschardins said. You know, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. You've heard this a million times mm-hmm. before. Uh, we're we're spiritual beings having a human experience. But what does that mean? You know, what? How can? And so the following uh, installments in my series are really going to be us. You know, even people who say that Deschardins quote, 
they still have a very human centric approach to how they're, you know, communicating. And I'm like, wait a second, let's be, what does it, what does it mean spirit from a, you know, biophysiologically from an anatomical point of view, what does that mean to be a spiritual creature having a human experience? And so that will be brought forward in the next films. And uh, I can't wait to see those because they're going to be really great. I suppose the best way to um, provide evidence would be in your own life. Um, How did this awakening that you described uh, actually manifest itself? Well, um, you know, my story is is quite tragic. Uh, You know, I... I invented this genius product. And by the way, I subsequently, that was just a toy, by the way. I mean, Skype, YouTube, yeah, whatever. I went off and invented something after I got fired called Universal Telecommunications, um, which had universal voicemail. It had, had I patented the idea for voice recognition, you can say that I invented Siri. I invented visual voicemail. I mean, I did a lot in Silicon Valley as far as being an innovator and and coming up with new ways of, of uh, you know, using technology. Um, but when I when I invented that product that was a combination of Skype and YouTube, my best friend uh, and soulmate and lover uh, was losing her battle with breast cancer. And as sad as that is to hear, you know, I, I don't I it's it's really impossible, I think, for people to get their minds around the fact that while I was moving my my kids, you know, and myself two times over that summer taking my friend to, you know, chemotherapy and that whole thing, radiation surgery. I invented this genius product. I mean, it was nuts to be, you know, I mean, the juxtaposition was, was, was amazing. And I got escorted out the door by a -a rent-a-cop, you know, and it was brutal. And then she passed away. Um, and my whole life was just, um, I was hurting. (laughs) I was, I was a hurting little puppy. And, uh, you know, it took a few years of just, I mean, I was, you know, grieving and, and then a lot of suffering. And, um, and, and I had always, I mean, I've had a lifetime of precognitive dreams, psychic experiences, you know, things. And I've always dabbled in um, different forms of meditation and, and that sort of thing. And um, around 12 years ago, I just decided, okay, you know, I'm going to just do this. So I you know, I took up a meditation practice, started doing a lot of yoga, um, practice meditation twice a day for the last dozen years. And, uh, you know, over a long time, it, uh, it really has a profound effect on you. After four years of meditation, I started having these, um, you know, what I can only describe as pure divine love, pure bliss meditations that lasted two, three, sometimes four hours of just sitting there in just this amazing rapture, whatever you want to call it. And the first thing you want to do when you you achieve this, you know, fourth state of consciousness that most people aren't aware of is is communicate that to people. And so I wrote a manuscript called Beyond Me. Um, I worked on it for a few years off and on. And finally, in 2010, uh, I decided I'd just make a documentary film. And eight weeks later, it was released. That's fantastic. I, what what you described of, of your journey moving from the depths of despair into a, a plane of not just equanimity, but um, you you would describe yourself today as a happy person, right? Oh, absolutely. And um, so many of us equate um, success with material success instead of achieving that kind of inner peace and state of happiness. And that's what is so... I think critical for humanity to absorb at this time the 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 uh, shift from viewing everything with a dollar sign uh, benchmark into a greater good or a personal good uh, benchmark. And this, you know, uh, and I, I say this at the end of the film. Um, you know, I've been, it's hard not to look out the window and see what's going on, especially the last month on the planet. Um, but I've never been more optimistic than I am right now. And it is happening. And I think actually what we're seeing when we turn on the evening news right now in, in France and Syria and Russia and everything else is that when the transition happens, 
you know, all the old brittle structures. They're, they're not going to go quietly in the night. You know, they're going kicking and screaming, and that's what we're seeing. So this, this sort of, you know, disruptions are happening on the planet right now are just a symptom of global healing. Mm. Mm. Well, you're going to um, uh, create a, a number of other films with, with this material and more. Um, are you, do you have any way of funding these? Do you have some kind of a donation thing on your website? Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't have a way of funding them right now. I, I've got, uh, and this one was, was low budget. Um, but the next one I could easily spend, you know, a significant more, um, money on because I want to do a lot more, you know, when you're trying to illustrate all these properties of human consciousness, I want to invest into a lot of, uh, you know, computer generated animations. I do have a 501 C three, uh, not for profit set up for if people wanted to make significant donations and I can definitely use a lot of, uh, capital to, to move forward on, on all kinds of different fronts. And that's all on my website. You have some of your older films available for, to watch for free, don't you? Uh, I moved them in an effort to, uh, help fund the future uh, productions. I've moved them all onto uh, pay-per-view. I see. So, uh-huh. so you can, you can rent them individually or you can get the entire bundle of all four films for a 20% discount. Well, I, I do recommend uh, our listeners to, to watch either the, the physics of the soul or, or beyond me or really any of them and get a feel for, not only the shift in consciousness that's happening, but the the real quality and contribution of Frank's work. So I I really want to thank you for your work, Frank, and um, tell the people again um, the <laughs> website beyondmefilms.com beyondmefilms.com Right, and uh, you know, thank you've been very kind and gracious with your time and your description of uh, you know my work and. You know, it's a labor of love, and it's something that it's my way of giving back. Well, let's hope that that influences uh, other people to take a page out of your book. We've been speaking with Frank Huguenard uh, about the physics of the soul, www.beyondmefilms.com. Stay with us, and we will be back after these messages. Free your mind with Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. The name is Bond. James Bond. No, the name is Joe. The Joe Show. And we are returning back for our ninth season here on Old Times Radio. So tune in every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, on oldtimes.com slash mobile. You can take us wherever you go. Yeah! Hi, this is Sylvia Henderson, Intuitive Life Coach and Energy Healer. Are you ready to elevate and rise way above your normal? Be sure to listen to my show, Intuitive Transformations, on Own Times Radio, Sunday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern. Get the inspiration you need to transform your life. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Ohm Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Feed your soul with waves of consciousness on Ohm Times Radio. Sidoroff, Ph.D. Um, Dr. Sidoroff is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at UCLA, as well as the director of the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Ethics. Stephen, I am very impressed. He presents seminars and professional training programs worldwide on resilience, 
optimal performance, addiction, and alternative approaches to stress and mental health. His innovative approaches his innovative approaches to treatment span a wide range of cutting edge research in brain and behavior, including peak performance in sports, psychosomatic and behavioral medicine, optimal fun- functioning, and ADD, and the use of neurofeedback in treating substance abuse and cancer. That's fascinating. Um, he is the author of his most recent book, The Path, Mastering the Nine Pillars of Resilience and Success. Couldn't we all do with that? And I am very pleased to welcome Stephen Sidorov. Well, thank you for that introduction, Miriam, and it's a pleasure to be on your show with you. Sorry, I've been tripping over my tongue, Stephen. Um, you know, Maybe I am under stress. When we listen to the news, I think it's very difficult to avoid being under stress at this time. And so that's why I was particularly keen on getting you on the show, because how you, your book actually has some fascinating approaches to dealing with stress. How, how is it different from other ways? Well, first of all, I take a look at all the different ways that we're impacted in our lives by stress and all of what we bring to a situation such as our own wounding and unfinished business that actually makes stress more impactful than it than it really needs to be and so my intention in my book is not simply to help people manage stress but help them uh, be more comfortable within themselves to also look at and address some of their emotional wounding so that stresses don't impact them as much as they are currently doing. That's interesting. So you're saying that if someone is already uh, kind of in a uh, delicate state, a delicate emotional state, that these external stressors will have that much more impact? Right. And it's it's sort of like a back and forth kind of thing because the more stress we put ourselves under, the more we challenge our coping abilities and make it more difficult to handle what's going on in our lives. And then on the other hand, some of our, uh, some of our wounding, such as the need to be loved, the need to be accepted, all of these things actually cause us to drive ourselves harder in life, which then creates additional stress. So the whole idea behind my nine pillars of resilience is that there are nine different ways that we can develop ourselves to handle all the kinds of ways that we encounter stress in our lives. Well, give us an example. Well, uh, I alluded it to it right there. The first, my first pillar is your relationship with yourself. And most people think in terms of stress, okay, these things are kind of coming at me. But if we are a person who is particularly critical with ourselves, uh, hard on ourselves, then whatever situation we encounter, we're going to add to that stress by, um, by that being hard on ourselves. I didn't do it right. I should have done it better. So – you can have a stressful experience, let's say, Miriam, that's a half hour in duration. But if the day before I start to worry about it so that my thinking contributes and my worry contributes, I will begin triggering my stress response a whole day before the actual event. And if I go to sleep worrying about it, then I have impaired sleep. I don't get full recuperation. And so, again, I'm making a half-hour situation worse. If after it's over, I start to say, well, is that did that person like what I said? Did I say the wrong thing? Now we extend the stress beyond the duration of the actual stressful experience. So my nine components are designed to address all these different ways that we um, – we experience stress, and we are affected by stress. Well, I certainly uh, resonate with all of the uh, mechanisms that you described. But telling somebody not to worry somehow is not really that effective. 
Are there any tips on how people can actually not worry? <laughs> well, I, I definitely agree with you. And, you know, I le- work with a lot of physicians who might say to their, their patients, you know, you need to relax more. In fact, they'll say, well, you need to get more sleep. You need to relax more. You need to stop drinking. And the patient walks out saying, I need to get a different doctor. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> because it sounds uh, so overwhelming. And that's another thing that I do in my book. And, and I've created this notion of the path. Uh, and the whole idea behind the path is at any one moment, you can't do everything that needs to be done to um, address your stress. You can only do one thing at a time. And the whole notion about the path is that if you are doing that one thing, that puts you on the path. And then you need to be appreciative that you're doing that one thing, even though there's still a lot of things that need to be done because people feel overwhelmed by all that they need to do. But, uh, you know, responding to your particular question about, say, worry and and negative thinking patterns, I introduced this concept of primitive gestalts in my book. And essentially, it's about the way that our brains develop based on our childhood environment and our childhood lessons. And our brain literally develops as if that environment of our childhood is the way the whole world works, which is furthest from the truth. And so our brains get locked in. In fact, we can say that our ability to adapt gets frozen due to the lessons and the learning of our childhood. And so what we are talking about now, for example, about worry about a future event or catastrophic expectations, imagining the worst possible outcome. These are all learned ways of thinking. And so in my approach and in my book, I suggest that I can't just tell you, stop that negative thinking. But I can give you a way of retraining your brain, of of learning more effective ways of thinking and then it becomes an ongoing process where each time you know you first have to have the awareness and be present and notice oh look I'm doing this negative thinking again and then going through a cognitive uh, lesson with yourself based on the information I present in my book that says this is not going to get you anywhere it's all an old way of doing it, and we need to do it in a new way. And so every time that you recognize that you're going down the wrong path, the ineffective path that you've been doing all your life, the first thing is, okay, look what I'm doing. But within the concept, uh, Miriam, of acceptance, rather than beating yourself up, okay, Let me look at this. This is what I've learned in the past. But now I have a new way of doing it, and let me do it this way. And Mm -hmm. so each time that you recognize this and each time that you're able to make that change, you are literally helping your brain function better. And it's a step-by-step, one-thing-at-a-time process. So it's recognizing that you're kind of initiating a pattern And somehow interrupting it and saying, okay, I don't have to go there. That's correct. That's correct. And if you can do that, that is success in the moment. And it may take literally dozens and dozens of times of reengaging that very same process to begin establishing healthier new patterns. But if you do it within the concept of acceptance – then you're willing to do this step-by-step process. I've heard that it takes 28 days to, or 21 days to change a habit. Is that your experience? I think it takes at least that, and I think you have to have patience. Mm-hmm. Because in the, the ironic thing is that when we're stressed, the newest lessons that we learn get thrown by the wayside and we revert unconsciously to the older lessons. So 
a lot of times, and that's again the whole idea behind being on the path, is that many times we're going to fall off the path because the stresses are too much for us in the moment. Recognize it and realize, well, I can I can get right back on the path simply by taking one positive step, like practicing a relaxation exercise. Mm -hmm. So it's an encouraging, hopeful approach where it acknowledges that things are going to take us off the path. But if we have a way of getting right back on it, then that's okay. And the path is simply the path to what? Self-mastery or, or uh, well, equanimity. Right. The path is, an, is the optimal way of being in this moment, each and every moment. Mm -hmm. And it's based on my nine components of resilience. What, what is the major component? Is there one really important one that's more important than the others? Well, I would say that the eight, after the first one, uh, are based on that first one, which is our relationship with ourselves. And again, in our childhoods, we get negative messages, even when they're not intended by our environment, by our parents. And because they go in at such an early age, they sort of feel right, even though, mm -hmm. and as I explain to people, that they're not in your DNA, they're not in your g genes, they are learned, and so they can be unlearned. Unlearned, unlearned absolutely. And so the, the, the book is called The Path, Mastering the Nine Pillars of Resilience and Success by Dr. Stephen Sidoroff. Uh, Stephen, do you have a website that he, people can find out more about you? Yes, I do. It is drstephensidoroff.com. It's D-R-S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S-I-D-E-R-O-F-F.com. -E -E and I have a lot of uh, my articles and blogs uh, on Great. that site for people. Super. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today. My pleasure. And stay with us. We will be back with our final guest after these messages. Conscious Media for Conscious Minds. Om Times. As difficult as it is to believe, there are places in Africa where human traffickers sell albino children and their body parts for use in magic rituals. Humanity Healing International is actively working in Uganda to change this paradigm. The Albino Rescue Project finds albino children who are at risk and places them in safe schools and environments where they can learn and grow free from fear. To learn more or to sponsor a child, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Hi, this is Angela Levesque, host of Entanglement Radio. Join me Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern for inspiring conversations with visionaries in spiritual science and conscious healing. Entanglement Radio, Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. Transcendent talk for the conscious mind. This is Terry Van Horn, and I want to invite you to join me for my weekly radio show, Hailing Light, on Ohm Times Radio, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On Hailing Light, we want to bring love, light, and blessings into your world. You can find out more about us at www.healinglightonline.com. Blessings. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. The cutting edge of conscious radio. Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM.
Prosper Writing Lab, she helps entrepreneurs, bloggers, and nonprofits tell their story. She's also the author of the Another Jennifer blog and the creator of the Simple Giving Lab and author of a wonderful new book called Simple Giving, Easy Ways to Give Every Day. And she is based in the other side of the country in Brunswick, Maine. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. I thought it was funny that you were talking about going to the other Portland. The other Portland, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Jennifer, you know, this is the time of year when all of the charities get their uh, letters out to potential donors. And uh, I think a lot of people are hurting nowadays. And your book is showing that money is not the only way to give. Tell us about it. What what um, are the ways that we can really incorporate this spirit of giving, which makes us feel better? Right. Um, into our lives. Well, in you know, in as you know, we're heading straight into the holiday season, and I started to the reason why I started to write more about philanthropy on my blog and sort of explore the topic and how we can give was because you know I have been in the nonprofit world for um, you know a decade now, and I've. You know, I've I actually wrote a letter last week asking for money. I mean, you know, it's part of the nonprofit world, and you know, as a donor, I sat back and I and I I could I kept thinking, you know what? I'm not giving enough because at the end of the year, I'm thinking, oh, I don't have enough money. I gotta, you know, shop for these other people and you know, family and things like that. So many things going on, and I I sort of got frustrated because I wasn't spreading out my giving enough. And then I sort of started, and then, you know, on the nonprofit side, I would see that, you know, people, donors, people who would call and, and just want to help out, weren't entirely sure how to help out or how to give. And I and I realized very quickly that it doesn't have to be money or, or time. There are so many different ways you could give. And, and I actually um, I have this Philanthropy Friday series in my blog and I, that I've been writing for several years. And I had all these different stories about how, you know, how people and businesses could incorporate giving into everyday life. And that sort of blossomed, you know, that, that I started look at, looking at all those posts and all the people that I talked to because I was looking for inst- inspiration for them. And I realized that um, I actually came up with six different giving models from that. Um, and I realized, you know, there's traditional ph- philanthropy, but, you know, there's sort of new and different ways you can do that. But you can also, you know, there's everyday acts of kindness. You can also, you know, be more conscious when you're shopping. Um, you can take, you know, really take what you're passionate about and take action on that. Um, there's also, you know, for entrepreneurs and, and business owners, just incorporating giving into into business. Um, into the business model. Um, and there's ways to just give it forward. If you're already, you know, sort of a giving person, like involving other people and inspiring other people to give in the ways that you do. So it sort of just blossomed from there. And now I try, you know, the point with the book is to not only think about giving during the giving, giving season, but all year round. How can we do that? It's really incorporating a, a spirit of compassion and and wanting to do good in the world into your life. Right. And it's sort of in the way I look at it is it's it's keeping giving top of mind and sort of changing your brain to think that that has to be, you know, time and money. It could be, you know, for example, I know one morning I was rushing to get out of the out of the uh house to get to work and get the kids to school and I had to write um signed a field trip permission slip real quick for one of my kids and I noticed there was a fee it was like a five dollar fee I noticed on the bottom it said you know if you wanted to um you know donate a little bit money towards um somebody else's fee a student who couldn't pay for it um you know that was also suggested if people could do it so you know very quickly this you know two minutes I signed it um, you know, made out a check for $10 and, you know, sent it with, with my son. And, you know, I felt good about the fact that, hey, I just paid for, you know, five mm-hmm. bucks, mm-hmm. another student who might not have gone on the field trip. So like little things like that to recognize, you know, opportunities in front of you. Right. You mentioned consumers and, and shopping. What labels yeah. should consumers look for if they're shopping consciously? 
Well, you know, it, with shopping consciously, there's a few different ways, approaches, or all of them really, that you can take. Um, you know, I look at shopping locally first, if you can, to, you know, support your local business owners. Um, I always think about, you know, the grocery store and stuff, looking for fair trade products. Um, that's off, often sometimes, you know, if I'm looking in the coffee aisle, for example, like what, you know, so many different options. A lot of times I look straight for first uh, fair trade products because I know that the the people who produce the coffee beans were paid fairly and um, supported in that way. Um, and, you know, I also think about, especially this time of year, any sort of um, product or gift that gives back is really great, too. Um, there's a lot of different, you know, to the market is a is a website, for example, that's in the book um, that is all survivor made goods. So you, there's beautiful scarves and jewelry and things like that. But you know, when you purchase from them, you're also supporting somebody else um, who is a survivor of some sort of conflict or human trafficking. Um, so there's a lot of different, you know, decisions and just being conscious about the products. Um, and the stores that you shop from, um, mm-hmm. you know, are they supporting the community, um, whether it be local or global, whatever is important to you? Do they have, you know, corporate social responsibility um, program? You know, what? how, you know, what's their carbon footprint? Sometimes you have to do a little resort, research, but it, it's also worth it. You can make a difference that way. So it's really just being thoughtful and 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 looking kind of behind the labels. Absolutely. I think one of one of the favorite um, my favorite parts of your book were the stories of the different entrepreneurs and how they came up with the ideas right. for the particular um, act, entrepreneurial business that they started. Absolutely, and I found you know that was you know like with my philanthropy series on my blog. That's what, I, what really inspired me. Just talking to other people because it's great to talk about different ways to give, but to actually read the stories of how people are doing it and getting ideas that way. Um, you know that that part of the reason for writing the book was to to share those stories, but also to have so people can actually take action. I tried to include some resources and things too, like okay, how can I use this and and, um, you know, do my own thing and, 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 and create my own way of giving. Mm. By the way, we're talking about Jennifer's book, Simple Giving, Easy Ways to Give Every Day. And it's Jennifer Iacovelli, I-A-C-O-V-E-L-L-I. Jennifer, what is your website? Uh, my website, my main website is anotherjennifer.com. Um, and I still actually do my Philanthropy Friday series. So um, I'm always... Always, always, and and actually, if people are listening, if they have stories um, of how people incorporate giving, definitely contact me because um, I love to tell those stories. But um, it's another Jennifer dot com, and also simplegivinglab dot com. What do you do in the Simple Giving Lab? That is, and that's a newer site, and I'm trying to develop that a little bit more. But I actually just I, I try to share just little bits of you know inspiration um, to give. You know, it could be a quote, it could be an article, it could be stuff from my own blog. Um, and I actually invite other people to submit, too. There's a, a, a spot, a tab on there that people can actually submit their own inspiration for giving. Um, so it's kind of just, you know, an ongoing thing where, you know, people can just get inspired to give a little bit more. Do you have um, maybe a list of, of like, um, conscious businesses on there that people can actively support? Yeah, I I actually have a list. Um, I have a gift. It's called Gifts That Give Back. And, and usually, because I do it around this time of year, I share it and stuff. But it's something that I um, update year round. Um, you know, it could be products that give back that, you, you know, it doesn't have to be a gift. But I do mm-hmm. update that so you can find products and also companies um, where you know anything from that list, anything um, that you, you know, website and stuff that you go to a product that you purchase is going to give back in some way. So and it's what, just the gifts that give back, and that's on both anotherjennifer.com and simplegivinglab.com. There should be a tab. Great. I, that, that's really something that uh, we want to be so conscious of at this time of year. Absolutely. Uh, really, our our 
the way we spend our money is one of the few ways that we actually have to influence change in the world. So uh, it's so important that we are very, very conscious of how we spend it. Right. And, you know, and I always encourage people to, 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 you know, this is sort of the give it forward thing, but, you know, talk about to talk about it too. You know, why do you support these certain products or companies or um, shop at a certain place, you know, um, or volunteer somewhere or donate to a certain cause? You know, when we talk about giving and how we give and how it makes us feel, um, or, you know, even just if we did a kindness act, act like, you know, paying for somebody's toll, it, it kind of, it's, it's fun and it inspires others to give or think about ways in which they can give as well. Well, I'm I'm inspired and I I hope our listeners are too. So go to another jennifer.com is it another jennifer blog? What what no, nope, other, another jennifer.com. Yep. Another jennifer.com or simplegivinglab.com. simplegivinglab.com. Great. We've been speaking with Jennifer Iacovelli, author of Simple Giving: Easy Ways to Give Every Day. And please visit her blog and um, her website and join this wonderful um, season of giving. Thank you so much for being with us, Jennifer. Thank you so much. And I hope you'll join us next week. In the meantime, please visit my website, New Consciousness Review at ncreview.com. And I hope you have a wonderful holiday season and us in the real spirit of giving and the spirit of light. Goodbye. <laughs>